Good morning, everybody. It is 12 noon in Tel Aviv. Right now, our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is meeting with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. He touched down in Tel Aviv just a couple of hours ago and started shaking hands. And in about 15 minutes, we expect the Secretary to meet with Israeli President, with the is Israel, Israeli President, whose name is Isaac Herzog, and we will carry that live when it happens. Blinken's visit comes as the Biden administration pushes for a pause on the war so they can get humanitarian aid in and the hostages out. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, Israeli forces come face to face with terrorists and take out a top Hamas commander. The, I, uh, the IDF says forces now have the largest city in Gaza surrounded. And today, Hezbollah's leader is scheduled to speak for the first time since Hamas attacked Israel. We have Fox team coverage with Jonathan Hunt live in the West Bank with Israeli forces that have been carrying out raids. But first, let's go to Trey Yinks, who's on the ground in southern Israel. Trey, what can you tell us? Yeah, hey, Lawrence, good morning. We know U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on the ground today. The Biden administration is expected to push for a humanitarian pause trying to encourage the Israelis to allow more aid into the Gaza Strip and some of those foreigners to get out. I do want to show you just behind me what Gaza looks like. Overnight, there was some heavy fighting that took place along the border here with the northern part of the Gaza Strip. Lots of flares launched overnight as the Israelis pushed deeper into Gaza, engaging those Hamas militants who popped out of tunnels and ambushed the troops. The Israelis releasing another name of a soldier that was killed this week inside Gaza, bringing the total to 24 Israeli soldiers killed since the ground push began. We do know they've been using the Navy and also the Air Force to strike different Hamas positions with the support of artillery units along the border. And all of that fighting comes again as the Biden administration is calling for a humanitarian pause. We do know that yesterday there was quite the exchange between John Kirby of the National Security Council and our Peter Ducey. Take a listen. So a pause does not help Hamas. A temporary pause that's localized that would allow us to get aid in and to get our people out is a good thing for the people of Gaza. It's a good thing for the Americans that are being held hostage. And it's not going to stop. Israel from defending itself because the security assistance we're, we're providing continues to flow. And a temporary pause doesn't mean a general ceasefire where the war is over. Peter has an important point here. Hamas would be helped by a pause in the fighting because it gives them more time to regather their forces and continue ambushes against Israeli troops inside the Strip. And so there will be some back and forth expected today between Israeli leadership and Secretary of State Blinken. This comes as the fighting rages on in the north. Three hours from now, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah, is slated to speak in public. He normally makes video addresses out of security concerns, but the Israelis are bracing for Nasrallah to announce a more a wider uh, participation by Hezbollah in the fighting in the north. And that does come as the Israelis keep striking positions in response to attacks against northern Israel. Guys. Trey, what's the, what's the benefit of him announcing it? He was just rocketing Israel without announcing it. What's the benefit of him making a formal declaration unless it's something that's going to be a total surprise? What, what are the indications he's going to say? Yeah, it's a great point. And look, uh, from our perspective, we actually don't think he's going to come out and announce a declaration of war, but this could be used as another step on the escalation ladder. Last night, late in the evening, I was on a call with an IDF spokesman, and I posed this question, and he says the Israelis have intelligence that Nasrallah will use this speech as an opportunity to at least appear like they are throwing more support behind Hamas, the second largest Iranian proxy in the region, and then be able to and I just want to step out of the frame here. There was just an airstrike behind me. So as we talk about this, I'm going to have my cameraman punch in. You can see here on the Gaza Strip. But it, he'll likely use this as an opportunity to step up on the escalation ladder. And when I asked Israeli officials about this, they pointed to the fact that yesterday there was an increase in attacks along the northern border. And the types of weapons that were being used against Israeli forces were, were more significant than we'd seen in the past. Traditionally, the, the past few weeks, we've seen Hezbollah using anti-tank guided missiles and small arms. Yesterday, they launched suicide drones against Israeli positions, and that just shows they have other weapons in their arsenal, and they are starting to use them against the Israeli forces in the northern part of the country. Trey, Guys? How, 
Trey, how trustworthy are the numbers that are being reported back here in America? Because if you go on social media, you see both sides arguing the numbers and how one can side you has big numbers. The exactly. Other side so much. These numbers are coming though from officials in Gaza. Can they be trusted? The death toll. Yes. We should definitely be critical of the numbers that we're getting from inside Gaza. We can report that thousands of civilians have been killed in the Israeli responses against the Gaza Strip since October 7th. But to quote an exact number, we have to attribute that to the Hamas-run Palestinian Health Ministry. Right. I will say traditionally, they have been the only source of information from inside Gaza, but there is no way for us to independently confirm those numbers. So we attribute to the Hamas-run Palestinian Health Ministry, but remain critical of the specific number of those killed. With that said as well, the Palestinians have released a list of every person killed inside Gaza. But again, there is no way to independently confirm each and every name on that list. So we re remain skeptical of the number, but we will say thousands of Palestinians have been killed in the response uh, launched by Israel since that massacre in southern Israel. That's right. And Trey, <clears throat> we split the screen. We were actually looking at the Rafah crossing along with your report. You can see that aid is coming in. So, so it, it sounds like Blinken is talking to Netanyahu. He's pushing for this humanitarian pause to get aid in and some people out of uh, Gaza. One of the other things uh, apparently he's being pressure, he's pressuring Netanyahu for is to get uh, to allow Israel to allow some more fuel into Gaza. But of course, the fuel can be used for rockets, and so far, Israel has said no. Is there any chance he's going to say, okay, sure, they need it for the hospitals, let's give them some gas? In terms of fuel entering the Gaza Strip, what we've heard from Israelis is very simple no, they're not going yeah. to allow fuel to enter Gaza. With that said, is there some sort of deal that could be cut behind the scenes to allow some fuel in in exchange for hostages? In that case, maybe they, they would bend a little and allow some fuel to go into Gaza. But we should be really clear about if fuel goes into Gaza, inevitably Hamas will take it to, to fuel their generators that they use to pump air into the tunnels beneath the strip and provide air conditioning for the Hamas leadership that is hiding beneath Gaza. And that's why the Israelis don't want to provide fuel. It's not that they, they don't want the Palestinian civilians to have fuel uh, in, in order to survive. They understand that Hamas will siphon some of that fuel, if not the majority of it, off and use it for their own efforts to continue the war. So, Trey, it's clear that the leader of Hezbollah wants people to know that he's alive. Uh, he wants to recruit. And it goes the same for Hamas as well. So I guess the big question is we, we see the impact here at home. We see the protests, the people that are rallying behind that movement. But I'm curious on the ground, the actual fighters that they're trying to recruit, how's that going on the ground? Do you see more men coming out in support that are sympathetic of Hezbollah, sympathetic of Hamas, or is there anger at the leaders? It's a great question, and we talked about this yesterday, and I, I found the clip and watched it again that I referenced when we spoke yesterday on Fox & Friends about a mother inside Gaza, and we weren't able to confirm if it was her, her child or, or one of her relatives, but she was there in front of a, a body of someone who was killed in an Israeli airstrike, and she was screaming out, those Hamas dogs, they did this, this is their fault, and, it, and someone comes into the frame and puts a hand over her mouth as to not let her say any more negative things about Hamas. Wow. But it gives you a sense that even Palestinian civilians inside Gaza understand they wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that massacre on October mm -hmm. 7th. And so there's definitely growing frustration. We also know we can't confirm the exact number, but we know that tips have been provided to the Israelis after a leaflet drop inside Gaza. And they were encouraging people to provide information to help Israeli war efforts inside the Strip. And so that's one part of this equation. The other part is, is Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And there are reports that indicate Iranian militias, Iranian-backed militias from places like Iraq and Syria are starting to push their fighters into southern Lebanon in preparation for this to expand. Hmm. And so Iran has, has tentacles, as it's been described before, across the Middle East. And they are trying to push, push the, the meter as much as possible here to see how, how deeply they can get involved without drawing a broader Israeli response. But they're playing with fire. 
The Israelis are only using a portion of their air force against Gaza, yep. and they've maintained a lot of firepower that they could use against the Iran Iranian regime if it does come to it. Yep, uh, they're behind everything. Uh, Trey, thanks so much. Sure. And to the north, Israeli forces involved in deadly raids in the West Bank. Let's go to Jonathan Hunt, who is live on the ground in Ramallah, which is one of the territories controlled by the Palestinians. Jonathan, uh, we know it's hard to get in and out of Gaza. Was it, is it hard to get in and out of the West Bank? No, uh, frankly, for us, it is not that difficult at all, Steve. Uh, but the great concern is here uh, that the protests, uh, the pro-Hamas protests, are growing much stronger throughout the West Bank. Now, uh, overnight, there were clashes between Palestinians and Israeli forces. Nine Palestinians across the West Bank were killed. That brings uh, to more than 100, close to 140 by some counts, the number of Palestinians killed in the West Bank since October 7th, and there have been something like 1,500 or so arrests of Palestinians made. All that is feeding into growing frustration here, growing anger here, growing support for Hamas. Now, we are just after noon on Friday here, which means the mosques throughout the West Bank here in Ramallah obviously are full right now. It is Friday prayers, the traditional day of prayer, but that also has always become the traditional day of prayer protest too. And uh, authorities here are and in Israel are expecting perhaps some of the biggest protests uh, we have yet seen in the West Bank. We will shortly be moving uh, towards where we believe one of those protests will be gathering. We'll bring that to you the next hour. But there is great concern here. And I speak to politically connected people here, Steve. And what they are telling me is that if there was an election here now, the much more moderate Palestinian authority would be kicked out and they believe Hamas would win the, an election in the West Bank. Just imagine how terrifying a thought that is, how terrifying a phrase that is to say to any Israeli. We are also hearing talk that Islamic Jihad is becoming a stronger and stronger force, particularly in the northern part of the West Bank, around places like Janine, where we have seen some of the most intense clashes between Palestinians and the IDF. So if Islamic Jihad is growing in power here, if Hamas is growing its support here. It is of great concern for Israel. So politically, uh, the future is of great concern. Today, the potential protests are of great concern. Steve Ainsley, Brian Lawrence. And Jonathan, real quick, anyone who says, oh, a two-state solution, that's the answer, like the President of the United States, it would be in the West Bank. And what country, what sane country would say it would be okay to let a terrorist nation form on the West Bank? Well, I'll, t I'll tell you this uh, briefly, Brian. I've been coming to uh, Israel for some two decades or so now and to the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and in Gaza. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of moderate people who have always talked about a two-state solution, but particularly in Israel now, that is very much not a subject of conversation for anybody. Uh, they cannot make peace. They cannot even think about a two-state solution, obviously, with Hamas. So if Hamas were eventually to come to power in the West Bank, then, yeah, it's absolutely off the table as far as every single Israeli is concerned. So the political path forward is fraught right now, Brian. Uh, nobody knows what shape that might take. And that's one of the problems. It's one of the things that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken wants to talk to the Israeli government about. Somebody has to start coming up with ideas right. for what comes next. Now, is that going to be an international peacekeeping force in Gaza quite possibly would that involve US troops in the on the ground quite possibly so there's a lot of scenarios being discussed none of them very good at the moment though Brian all right thanks Jonathan appreciate it uh, he just mentioned Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken as you can see in the corner of the screen right there we are expecting him he could pop in in about a minute uh, mm -hmm. and as soon as he comes out to announce what uh, he and Netanyahu talked about we will take you there live meanwhile let's go down to Washington real quick uh, as predicted, the House of Representatives under uh, Republican leadership voted to give the Israelis military funding to the tune of about $14 billion. Uh, it does not include humanitarian aid or assistance for Gaza. It's interesting, uh, before the vote, the White House was actually calling Jewish Democrats, urging them to vote no. But ultimately, at the end, and you just saw on that uh, scoreboard, 12 Democrats voted with the Republicans. 
However, two Republicans voted no as well. Yeah, Thomas Massey and Marjorie Taylor Greene said no. So it, it will cut funding from the IRS. Remember the IRS got the $80 billion boost during the Inflation Reduction Act? And uh, Kevin McCarthy, his debt limit deal stripped a little bit of money away from the IRS, but they still have $67 billion. And the speaker, the new speaker, Mike Johnson, said the IRS has the largest pile of money, so this mm -hmm. makes sense fiscally to take it from, from them. Right. Well, but the White House said, you know, it's, it's a bad idea, and Joe Biden has uh, threatened to veto it. He yeah. said it's a bad idea if you're going to get emergency money, money by cutting some money somewhere else, because if it's an emergency, you need the money right now. I think most of Americans don't like the IRS, so it was the easiest thing to do to get American support. I think the other thing, Brian, that the president is upset about is that it didn't have Ukraine funding. Uh, right. He wanted to put all these bills together to get one package. But although the president has been able to make the case for the support of Israel, he hasn't been able to make the, the case to the American people on why we should continue to fund uh, Ukraine. And this is on the heels of even information coming out in, from Zelensky's administration right. of corruption. And apparently they've been spending the money like crazy, crazy. in Ukraine. And it's not for the war. Right. Um they do have to put some, find out how it's being spent, but you cannot let Ukraine die in the vine because the generations will pay the price. But having this $14 billion, Democrats are floating an idea. They think they would get the Republicans' interest, and that is on the border, floating proposals to change the asylum rules and maybe bringing up remain in Mexico and getting some money and some changes there. Is there anything more important in our country than getting our southern border under control? And believe it or not, you would think it's in the president's interest to do this anyway, not as a favor to Republicans, yeah. but that's what they're putting out there because they know these Democratic mayors went to see him yesterday and they have the same complaints as Republicans, and that is, my cities are overwhelmed. Your policy is absolutely awful. We have no money to take care of these people. What the hell are you doing? So they think they've, they've put together a package to entice Republicans to expand the package a little bit. It's dead in the Senate, and the president says he'll veto it. I don't know where it goes from here. Yeah, because the Senate wants the aid for Ukraine in there as well. And so by the way, see. why is Marjorie Taylor Green yeah. against this? Yeah. What did she say? Why is Thomas I, Massey a mayor? Well, I understand Thomas Massey. He, he, he's a spending hawk. He is. In the, it's in, all in about the sense money. of he wants it, uh, a conservative approach to do this. So he's been consistent. I'm not surprised by his vote. But it's paid for. That. It's paid for. What is he worried? I mean. Well, nothing is paid for if we have debt going on right now. No, but now. I mean. So right, I think but he's always put had that aside. position. Of that. I'm not surprised, but Marjorie, I am surprised. All by right, it. so that happened in, in D.C. yesterday, and we'll continue to talk about that.